Shabbat Shalom to my friends and my spiritual family members in our Lord, our Savior, our Master, Yehoshua HaMashiach, Yeshua the Messiah, or Jesus the Christ. Peace to you, my friends, on this, the seventh day of the week, the Sabbath day of our everlasting Father in heaven. Hallowed is his great name, Yehovah. Yehovah, he who was, who is, and who is to come. Holy, 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 Yehovah, God Almighty, the one and only true God, the everlasting King, the creator of all things. This day, the seventh day, is his Sabbath day, and I hope that his shalom, his peace, will be with you all. Shabbat Shalom. Thank you, my dear friends, for joining me for this week's Sabbath teaching from the book of Jeremiah, and I welcome you all to the Sword of Yehovah Ministries. This ministry, for the entire time it has existed, from the beginning till today, and forever, however long it lasts, this ministry has always, always, always been about Yehovah, God, the Everlasting Father, and His Sword, or His Word. The Word of Yehovah is the Sword of Yehovah, and the Word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any double-edged sword. And that sword, as I repeat every single week, because it needs to be repeated, it is so important that we get this so deeply ingrained in our minds, in our hearts, in our souls, that we understand and know that this is the Word of God. It has two forms, the written recorded form and the living form in the image of the Son of God, who is Yeshua, Messiah, our Lord. And the Word of God, both forms of the Word, written and living, it is the way, the truth, and the life. And I can promise you, in the name of Yehovah God Himself, that if you will just trust, if you will hold to the Word, written and living Word of Almighty God, you will have everlasting life. If you are a wise man or wise woman and you build your life upon the rock of truth, then no matter what challenges, what trials, no matter what storms you are called to go through in this life, your life, your house is going to weather all of those storms and at the end of this life, at the end of the storm, your house will stand. You will stand because you are built on the rock. The rock is Yehovah God and His sword, His word, written and living word, the way, the truth, and the life. You build your life on that rock and you will never, ever fall. It's those that choose to build their lives on the sand, the sandy foundation of man's word and what the world says, they are going to go through the same storms, the same trials or many similar trials and tribulations that we're called to go through. But at the end of this life, at the end of the storm, they're going to fall. They are going to fall because all those who do not build on the rock, all those who choose instead to build on the sand, their house will fall and great will be the fall of it. We need to make sure that that's not us. We need to be wise servants and not foolish. We need to build our lives on the rock so that we never fall. The kingdom of God is the goal. The kingdom of God is the destination. That's where we want to be. I'm not satisfied with anything less than being in the presence of my Father forever and ever. 
It's the holy city, the new Jerusalem. That's where I want to be. And so I choose right here, right now. I choose every single day to continually build my life, build my everything I am and everything I have on Yehovah and His Word. I trust Yehovah. I trust His Word. And the Word says, Yehovah's promise is that if you trust in Him, you will never fall. I thank you once again for joining me for this week's Sabbath teaching. We're in the book of Jeremiah. We're going to cover Jeremiah chapter 39 and 52 this week, the fall of Jerusalem. Oh, and by the way, I need to start off by at least apologizing. I am sorry. I hope it's not too big of a distraction. I realize that I've got a bloodshot eye right here. Yeah, you can probably see it, you know, pretty good in the camera. Uh, it's the result of staring into a computer screen all day long. <laughs> That's pretty much what I do. I, I work on the computer all day, and uh, sometimes I go to the mirror afterwards and like, oh, oh, there it is, you know, just bloodshot eye. So I do apologize. I hope it's not too big of a distraction. I am sorry. But what can I do? It's I always film the weekly Sabbath teachings on Thursday night so that I have enough time to import the video, edit, export, and get it uploaded to YouTube in time for Shabbat, in time for uh, Friday evening as the sun goes down. But, uh, yep, went down to the bathroom only uh, about an hour ago, looked in the mirror and like, ah, well, there it is. How about that? Oh, well, I do apologize. Nevertheless, we're going to continue. Here we are. We are in Jeremiah chapter 39, and we're also going to cover chapter 52. Chapter 39 is the fall of Jerusalem, and then chapter 52, which is the last chapter of Jeremiah. Chapter 52 is the final chapter of Jeremiah. Chapter 52 is the fall of Jerusalem reviewed. So they're basically saying the same thing, 39 and 52, although 52 includes additional details that are not recorded in chapter 39. But before we get into this teaching, as we always do, I invite you, my brothers and sisters, to join with me in dedicating this teaching and this time that we're together, this time that we're together in the Word of Yehovah, let's dedicate this teaching to Yehovah, our everlasting Father, and I would invite you to please join me. Thank you. Everlasting Father, great God in heaven, Hallowed is your name. Father, Yehovah, we call out to you. In faith, we call out to you, trusting in you and trusting in your word, in your promises. We come before you, Father, covered by the righteousness of your Son, Yeshua, and we plead with you, hear our prayer. And our prayer, Holy Father, is that you will be with us. We ask, Father, for your Spirit to abide in us, to dwell in us. We ask, Father, in Yeshua's name, that if there is anything at all in these temples that you have created for your Spirit to dwell, if there's anything at all, in these temples that is not of you, but is of the enemy, any darkness, we ask, dearest Father, that you send your fire down into these temples and burn out all of that darkness, drive all of it out, 
so that these temples will be pure and holy and worthy to house your Holy Spirit. I pray specifically, Father, that you will be with me this day, that you will fill me with your Spirit and you will put your word in my mouth. May this teaching be a blessing to you, Father, and give glory and honor and praise to your great name. And may it also be a blessing to your people. May we all be edified by the truth and light of your word. And may those that are currently in darkness, Father, may we be used as tools in your hands to help them to see the light and to come to the light. Is our prayer in Yeshua's name. Amen. Thank you, my brothers and sisters, for joining me for that prayer. And I invite you to turn to Jeremiah chapter 39, where we will begin. This is the fall of Jerusalem. All right, we need to just step back for one second and think about this. We've been in the book of Jeremiah for a long, long, long time. It's not an exaggeration when I say that we've been in the book of Jeremiah for over two years, because we have. <laughs> we have actually just barely over two years. Uh, we started Jeremiah, I want to say it was, it was uh, February, it was either February or March of 2017, and here we are in March 2019, and the book of Jeremiah has been building and building and building and building towards this event, an event that has been prophesied by Yehovah God through his chosen prophets, such as Jeremiah, for literally decades. Jeremiah has been warning the people of Jerusalem, he's been warning the people in the land of Judah that because of their wickedness, because of their abominations, because of their continual rebellion against Almighty God, that Nebuchadnezzar from the land of Babylon, he's going to bring his armies against Jerusalem and Jerusalem and all the cities and towns and villages of Judah are going to be destroyed. And there will be a group, a certain small group that will be taken captive into Babylon. There will be a few individuals, a few people left in the land of Judah but the vast majority will be destroyed. The vast majority are going to be destroyed. Jeremiah has now been preaching and teaching and suffering with these people, or suffering, I should say, by these people in the majority of the cases. He's been beaten, he's been mocked, He's been ridiculed, he's been thrown in prison, thrown in the stocks, thrown down into a dungeon. People have threatened his life numerous times. His own family members wanted to kill him. He's been preaching and teaching and prophesying and speaking the holy word of the holy God for 40 years. And during that 40-year period, yes, there have been some people, some people that have listened, but not very many, not very many. Jeremiah is often referred to as the sorrowing prophet, the weeping prophet, the mourning prophet, because Jeremiah had such an extraordinarily difficult ministry, 40-year-long ministry. And that number 40, by the way, 
is the number of testing. It's the number of testing. It, in the time of, of Noah's flood, it rained for 40 days and 40 nights. Moses went up on Mount Sinai twice, back to back, both times, 40 days and 40 nights, where he fasted. And he was in the presence of Almighty God, but he was fasting. No food, no water, no liquid at all. 40 days and 40 nights twice. Our Lord Yeshua fasted in the wilderness 40 days and 40 nights. 40, 40, 40. Israel wanders in the wilderness for 40 years. 40 days, 40 weeks, 40 years, whatever it is you're looking at, the number 40 is the number of testing and trial and tribulation. This is the image of Jeremiah's entire ministry, a 40-year-long ministry of trial and tribulation and sorrow and hardship, and Jeremiah actually gets to see the very event that for 40 years he had been prophesying would happen. That's something that not all prophets get to see. For instance, Micah, this is just the example I'm using, Micah the prophet also prophesied about the destruction of Jerusalem and the destruction of the whole land of Judah. He prophesied about it, that it would happen. But Micah prophesied about the destruction about a hundred years before Jeremiah. So Micah never actually saw it happen. Perhaps he saw it happen in vision, but he wasn't actually there. He wasn't there to live it, to experience it. But Jeremiah was. Jeremiah is this prophet who saw extraordinarily little fruit from his labors. I mean, he planted seeds all his life. He was out there working in the metaphorical field, just day in and day out, morning to evening, planting and sowing seeds. But the vast majority of seed, the word of God that he is planting, that he is sowing, it's not falling on good ground. It's not falling in good soil, soft, fertile soil, fertile soil of the heart. The vast majority of the word of God that he's sowing among this hard-hearted people, the seed is falling by the wayside. It's falling on in the rocky places. It's falling among the thorns. It's not actually entering and penetrating the, the steeled hearts of these wicked, rebellious people. And so because of that, Jeremiah saw very little fruit from his labors throughout his life. But we can take heart... Because I know I've felt the same way. Now, I guarantee I have never felt it to the same degree that Jeremiah felt it. Obviously. None of us have. Okay? None of us have. Just like I have never gone through, say, a Job, a true Job experience. And I certainly pray I never will. Most of us, if not all of us, we've never gone through what Job went through, so we can't fully empathize with Job. We haven't gone through all the things that Isaiah went through, or Jeremiah, or Ezekiel, etc., etc. So we can't fully and completely empathize with these individuals, but at least to a degree, I can say of myself that I feel Jeremiah's pain. I feel his pain. I feel his sorrow. I feel his lamentations, as he is the author of the book of Lamentations. Lamenting, sorrowing, weeping. To a degree, I know I have felt what Jeremiah felt. To labor sincerely, genuinely, to work hard in planting and sowing the seed of the Word of God in the hearts and minds of God's people 
and a lot of them, even the vast majority, vast majority of them, do not want to know. They don't want to hear. They'd rather call you names. They'd rather mock you and ridicule you and spread lies and rumors about you and cast your name out as evil from among them and do all these things. So, at least to a degree, I can say, and probably a lot of you can say, at least to a degree, we empathize with Jeremiah. But here's where the hope comes in. Here's where the hope comes in. Even though Jeremiah didn't see fruit in his life, how many millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of people have been blessed in the 2,600 years since Jeremiah because of his ministry. There, there isn't a number. I mean, it, there's, there's no way you could possibly put a number to it. But it's in the hundreds of millions. Hundreds of millions of people over the last 2,600 years have been blessed by the labors of this man. The absolute pain and sorrow that he went through in life has blessed countless people. And the same can be true for our own labors. We might not be called to do the same things that Jeremiah was called to do. We might not be called to go through a 40-year-long ministry and then ultimately see the destructions of the people and the cities and the nation, etc., etc., even though I genuinely do believe that you and I are going to be seeing the destruction of our own nation in the not-so-distant future. All the signs, physical and spiritual signs, are certainly there. I mean, the dominoes are already, are already falling. It's just a matter of time before they all go. So I do believe that we are going to be seeing great destructions in our life. But nevertheless, no matter what we're called to go through, we can take heart that even if we don't see great fruits in the immediate here and now, we can trust in Yehovah God that He will take the work that we do and He will multiply it, just as He did through His Son Yeshua with the multiplication of the, the fish and the loaves of bread. He's got a couple fish and he's got five loaves of bread. But by the power of Yehovah God, multiply it to feed the masses, to feed an enormous number of people. That's what we take hope in. That's what we trust in. That's... I mean, I don't do this work just in the hope that I can reach people in the here and now. I do this work knowing that God is going to multiply those loaves and those fishes just as he multiplied the labors and ministry of Jeremiah to reach a great number of people, to bless their lives. Ultimately, the mission is to bring people to God and to bring people to Christ. But, as we get into Jeremiah 39 and 52, we recognize the truth that if a rebellious, wicked people continually rebels against God, then this is their end. This is what it comes to. If a people reaches the edge of that cliff and they jump off, they will be destroyed. Jeremiah chapter 39. In the ninth year of Zedekiah, king of Judah, in the tenth month, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and all his army came against Jerusalem and besieged it. In the eleventh year of Zedekiah, in the fourth month, on the ninth day of the month, the city was penetrated. The walls came down, or at least a breach in the walls was made. 
and they entered the city. Then all of the princes of the king of Babylon came in and sat in the middle gate. Now, this is interesting, because we're going we're to pause right here in verse 3 and talk about these, these names of these Babylonians. And when I speak these names, it's difficult to not speak them in this kind of guttural voice, this deep guttural voice. Listen, listen to the description, listen to the, the pronunciations of these Babylonian names. Nurgle Sharezer, Samgar Nebo, Shashem Shar Sachim, Rabsaris, Nurgle Sarezer. We read Nurgle Shah Rezer. This is Nurgle Saw Rezer. Rab Mog. Uh, uh, Rab Mag. With the rest of the princes of the king of Babylon. Whew. Oh my goodness. Okay. Up until this point, as we've been going through the uh, first 38 chapters of Jeremiah, and as uh, I said earlier, that We've been in Jeremiah now for about two years, and the reason why it's taken two years just to get to the where we are now in 39 is because if you're diving down deep, deep into the Word of God, you can spend entire teachings, two, three, four hour long teachings on a single verse if you're really diving deep, and that's what I've been striving to do for the last two years. So here we are, chapter 39, verse 3, and we got all these Babylonian names. Up until this point, there have been many, many names we've read throughout the book of Jeremiah, but they've all been Hebrew names. And Hebrew, if, if you ask me, Hebrew is a beautiful sounding language. It is. I mean, even, even though there are a few tones, there's a few sounds that are, have that, uh, like in the back of the throat, like uh, Hanukkah, for instance. Americans would say Hanukkah, but more of a correct pronunciation would be Hanukkah. Hanukkah. Now, I, as far as, you know, when it comes to speaking either biblical or conversational Hebrew, I'm not your guy. I'm learning, and I would love to one day be fluent in Hebrew, but uh, definitely not there yet. But I can tell you that Whenever I listen to a native Hebrew speaker, the Hebrew language is beautiful. It's gorgeous. It just flows. And, and even those back of the throat sounds, they, they come out sounding beautiful somehow when a native speaks. It's just amazing. It's a beautiful, incredible language. It is, it is a language that God designed. It is, a, it is the language of the Almighty. It's an absolute beautiful language. And if it isn't actually the, the language of the Almighty, I can say that it's easily the closest language currently in existence to the holy language of God. I mean, it's, it is an incredible, beautiful, beautiful language. But here we come to these Babylonian names, and they sound totally different than any Hebrew name that we've ever read. I mean, listen to these. Nurgle Sharezer, Samgar Nebo, Sarsechim, Rabsaris. Ooh, I mean, they just sound bad. When you say, when you say Rabsaris and Nurgle Sharezer, it just, it really doesn't sound all that pleasant, does it? It doesn't sound pleasant. Now, I mention this because I go to something we read last week in Jeremiah, or in our Jeremiah teaching. I made reference to Deuteronomy chapter 28, where through Moses, 900 years earlier, from this point, 900 years earlier, Yehovah God, through Moses, prophesies of this very destruction 
that they would be besieged and destroyed because of their wickedness. But I point out one thing in particular. It says, Deuteronomy 28, verse 49, Yehovah will bring a nation against you from afar, from the end of the earth, as swift as the eagle flies, a nation whose language you will not understand. Bam! A nation whose language you will not understand. And we even see evidence of that in the very names of these Babylonian princes. And the names just sound, wah! I mean, just, they, they have a really nasty tone to them, a nasty sound to them. Now, I can't make mention of that without also making mention of certain Hebrew individuals that were carried away captive into Babylon and had their names changed. And we'll talk about the reason why they had their names changed. There were a total of three separate captivities, if you will, three separate times when Jews from the land of Judah, specifically the capital city, Jerusalem, were carried away captive from their land, their home, to Babylon. And every time someone was taken from Judah into Babylon, what the Babylonians did, one of the things they did in order to try and erase their national identity and erase their memory of who they are and who their God is. They would change their names. A few examples for you. We've all heard of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That's how they are commonly referred to. That's how they're referenced in the book of Daniel. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But that is not their Hebrew names. That's not the names they were given. Their Hebrew names is Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And what do these Hebrew names mean? Hananiah means Yah, or Yehovah, is gracious. It's a name glorifying the eternal God, Yehovah. Mishael, Mishael is a variation of Michael, Michael, which means, who is like God? Referencing Yehovah as the God. Who is like God? No one, nothing, nothing and no one is like Yehovah God. So that's Mishael. Azariah means Yah has helped. These are gorgeous Hebrew names. Yah is gracious, who is like God, and Yah has helped. All three of them just glorifying God. But the Babylonians changed their names to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Hmm, what do these names mean? Shadrach, his name is possibly derived from Shurdur Aku meaning the command of Aku. Who's Aku? The moon god, the moon god of Babylon. Hmm, how about that? Command of Aku. Meshach is probably a variation of Mesha-Aku, meaning who is like Aku. <laughs> you see that? His Hebrew name was Mishael, saying, who is like God, that God of the Hebrews, Yehovah, and the Babylonians change his name to mean, who is like Aku, who is like our great Babylon, Babylonian moon god, or moon goddess to be more precise. The, the moon god is always... Uh, depicted in the feminine. It's the sun god that's always depicted as masculine. The moon god is feminine. And Abednego, 
is either slave of the god Nebo. There's this name here. Verse 3, chapter 39. Samgar Nebo. So Abendigo is either slave of the god Nebo or Nabu, or it is a variation of Abenergal meaning slave of the god Nurgal. Hmm, other names. Nurgal, Sharezer. So, Nurgal, Nebo, Nurgal, all of these names, Babylonian names, are given to give praise and worship to these Babylonian gods. And these Hebrews, these Jews, taken out of Judah, captive into Babylon, Three in those three separate times, which would include Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, or Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael, uh, Ezekiel, all of these individuals, they're taken into Babylon and they have their names changed to erase their national and religious identity. The two identities that are the most important. The most important. In fact, it was, uh, I am a huge, huge fan of Dennis Prager, of Prager University. I think Dennis Prager is just one of these individuals who is just, he's, he's filled with the knowledge and wisdom of God. I mean, he is. He's just, he's a great, great man. I, 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 I have just nothing but love and respect for Dennis Prager. And every week, Dennis Prager has what's called his weekly fireside chats. And it was just this week's fireside chat where he talked about this very issue, that the two identities that every human being needs to have in order to be filled with purpose and fulfillment and satisfaction in their life, to have actual purpose and happiness in your life, you need two transcendent identities. And that is a national identity and a religious identity. And Dennis Prager acknowledges, and I acknowledge as well, that there is good nationalism and bad nationalism. Americanism is good nationalism. Nazi Germany nationalism is bad nationalism. It's obvious. So there's good nationalism and there's bad nationalism. There's good religion and bad religion. Judeo-Christian religion is, for the most part, the vast majority of it, is good religion. Hinduism and Islam and... Uh, Satanism, I mean, that's, that's certainly a religion. Atheism, atheism is a religion. You, you can't know that there isn't a God. You have to believe. You have faith that there isn't a God. You have to have that belief. There's obviously bad religions. But nevertheless, if you are to be filled with joy and happiness and purpose and drive in your life, you need to have two transcendent identities. Identities that are above you, greater than you, bigger than you. And they need to be centered in truth. They need to be good things. Those things is good nationalism and good religion. If you have a good national and a good religious identity, those transcendent identities, then there's a very, very good chance that you're going to have a, a purpose, happy, a purpose driven, happy life, a fulfilled life. I know that that's, that's, that's what I have as far as my two transcendent identities, if you will. It's I'm an American, and I am a, uh, a believer, a Hebrew roots Christian believer, whatever you would like to label it as. I am a true worshiper of Yehovah, everlasting God. I have my 
identity in Yehovah God and in his son Yeshua. But what do the Babylonians do to the Hebrews that they take captive? They want to erase both those good transcendent identities and replace them with two bad, very bad transcendent identities. Babylon, Babylon is your nationality now, bad nationalism, and the worship of all these pagan gods, which you are now named after, bad religion, <laughs> very much so. This is what Satan does, and he's still doing it today. Satan wants to do the exact same thing. Now, whether he does it like he did at the time of uh, Babylon and taking uh, the Jews captive into Babylon, where he literally is wiping away this people's national and religious identities, or whether he does it in more of a metaphorical spiritual sense, it's still the same thing. Satan uses this same tactic today. He will do everything in his power to erase those two transcendent identities, good identities. I, I, I love, I love being an American. I love being an American. I love America. I love what America was founded on, founded on the Word of God, the Bible. I believe in the American idea, the idea that our founding fathers had with the establishment of this nation. I believe in America. I believe in that idea. And my heart sorrows every single day to see my beloved nation just crumble to dust before my very eyes. Very much so like Jeremiah saw his nation crumble to dust. Spiritually and, mor and morally just crumble, just be flushed down the toilet. Breaks my heart. This is Satan doing everything he can to destroy that good identity of Americanism, good nationalism, replacing it with globalism. You see what he does? He wants to get rid of good, this good identity, and replace it with a bad identity. Out with America, in with globalism. New world order, world government. All of this religion, these Judeo-Christian beliefs, which by the way, Judeo-Christian, uh, the Judeo-Christian religion, primarily, you know, Jewish and Christian, the number one religions that are targeted in this world, the most hated religions in the world, easily. Why? Because they're the only religions that are actually established on the truth of God's word. That's why Satan is going to war against all who believe in the Judeo-Christian faith. Everyone that is, of, that is built on this foundation, Satan goes to war against. He absolutely goes to war against. So Satan tries to erase the good national identity, and he tries to erase the good religious identity. And he replaces the national identity with a global New World Order identity, and he replaces the re good religious identity with a bad religious identity. It's called materialism. It's called atheism. It's called secularism. It's called consumerism. It's called what, it's called worldliness. Whatever you want to call it, it has many names. It's built on the same idea. That you are God. There's no God you have to answer to. You only answer to yourself. If it feels good, do it. That is a bad religious identity. This is exactly what Satan does. He wants to take, in that spiritual sense... He wants to take you, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah. He wants to take you and change you, take you captive into Babylon, 
take you captive by sin and change your identity. Change who you are. Turn you into a Shadrach, Meshach, and an Abednego. Now, obviously, when it comes to these literal people, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, it didn't work. Satan's plan, the plan that he had in, with them being in Babylon, didn't work. We know it didn't work because God Almighty, Yehovah, proved through his righteous, faithful servants, even in Babylon, the very same thing that he proved to the Egyptians at the time of the Exodus. Yehovah went to war against the Egyptian gods, saying to Ra, Isis, Horus, Anubis, Sobek, you are not God, saying to Pharaoh, you are not God. I am God. I am the one and only true God, Yehovah. He does the exact same thing through his faithful servants in Babylon. Through Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He does the same thing through Daniel, whose name, Daniel, means God is my judge, whose name was changed to Balthazar. Balthazar, meaning Bel, protect the king. Bel was a Babylonian god. His name was Daniel. God, referring to Yehovah, is my judge. And his name is changed to Balthazar. Bel, protect the king. Same thing happened technically uh, many, many years later. Even after the 70-year captivity in Babylon was over and Jews had been permitted to return to Judah and Jerusalem, there were many Jews that stayed in Babylon, and one of them, a descendant of one of them, was Hadassah, whose name was changed to Esther. What's Esther? What's Esther mean? Ishtar, <laughs> the Babylonian fertility goddess. This is what Satan does. He wants to change your identity. He wants to take away who you are, who God created you to be. You were created in the image of God, a sinless divine image, but Satan, Lucifer, wants to mold you and shape you and transform you into his image, the image of sin, the image of wickedness, the image of rebellion against God. And he does this in a very, very literal way. But nevertheless, God, Yehovah, can still use his people even in these situations. And Yehovah Prove to the Babylonians through his faithful servants, <laughs> Bel is not God. This Aku is not God. Nebo is not God. Nurgle is not God. Marduk. Marduk is one of these gods of Babylon. In fact, it was Nebuchadnezzar's desire in taking all of the the bronze and the gold and all of the, the implements and articles out of the temple in Jerusalem, King Solomon's temple, he brought all of that to Babylon to put all of it in the temple he was building and dedicating to a Babylonian god named Marduk. But Yehovah says to all of these Babylonian gods and goddesses, none of you are God. Not a single one of you. You're all fakes and frauds and phonies and fairy tales and figments of the imaginations of wicked people. I am God. Only me. There, is, there are none like me. I know not one. There were no, there were no gods created for, or formed before me, and there will be no gods created or formed after me. I am the one and only. That's what Yehovah does. He proves it through Daniel, 
through Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. He proves it through Esther or Hadassah. God proves who he is. He proves that good national identity and good religious identity. Now, I'm going to take that national identity one step further. It's true. I love America. I love America, and I do identify as an American. But there's even a national identity that transcends a good, I would say, purist national identity that transcends American. That identity is Israel. And I'm not, and I am not, referring to the actual, literal, political, border nation of Israel. I'm talking about the house of Israel, the spiritual house of Israel, the spiritual nation of Israel. That, ultimately, is my national identity. Hmm. You want to talk about having the greatest national identity, that's the identity that you want. It's wonderful to be an American. Or, by the way, if, if you are from Brazil, if you're from France, if you're from England, no matter where you're from, it's good to have a national identity. It is good. But better than good... The best national identity you could possibly have is that spiritual national identity that you identify as, I am Israel. I am Israel, and Yehovah is my God. If you have those two transcendent identities, well, then you're going to be doing just fine in this world. You're going to be doing just fine. But ultimately, this is what Satan wants to do. He wants to take away all borders in this world, replace it with globalism. So he's taking away those physical national identities. He wants to take away your spiritual national identity. He doesn't want you to be spiritual Israel. He wants you to worship him. He wants you to bow down to him, the God of this world. And he wants to remove your religious identity. He wants to change your name. That's exactly what Satan wants to do. He doesn't want you to have the name of Yehovah or the name of Yeshua written upon you. He wants his name written upon you. He wants you sealed to him. It's up to us to fight against that enemy. Just as... These faithful servants of God did fight. They were in Babylon. They lived in that society, that Babylonian society. But nevertheless, they remained true and faithful to their highest identities. Getting back to Jeremiah 39, it reads in verse 4, So it was when Zedekiah, the king of Judah, and all the men of war saw them, that they fled and went out of the city by night, by way of the king's garden, by the gate between the two walls. And, and he went out by the way of the plain, that is the Jordan Valley. But the Chaldean army pursued them and overtook Zedekiah in the plains of Jericho. And when they had captured him, they brought him up to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, to Riblah in the land of Hamath where he, Nebuchadnezzar, pronounced judgment on him, Zedekiah. Then the king of Babylon killed the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes in Riblah. The king of Babylon also killed all the nobles of Judah. Moreover, he put out the eyes of Zedekiah. He put out Zedekiah's eyes. What a statement to make by King Nebuchadnezzar. He basically is going to slaughter your entire family, all your children, making you watch, as in, he says right there, that before his eyes, you know, before his eyes, 
king of Babylon killed Zedekiah's sons. He also killed all the nobles of Judah, and then he put out Zedekiah's eyes. Basically saying, this last thing that you've seen, yeah, it's going to be with you for the rest of your life. That last thing. Whew. And he bound him with bronze fetters to carry him off to Babylon. And the Chaldeans burned the king's house and the houses of the people with fire and broke down the walls of Jerusalem. You see, it was when it says here that the city was penetrated, it can also be translated as the city was breached, as in there was a breach in the wall at some point, and the army was able to enter. But it was later that the whole walls of Jerusalem were broken down. And they remained broken down for roughly 150 years. For about 150 years until a guy named a guy named Nehemiah went, what are we doing? <laughs> he felt uh, the fire of God, you know, burning underneath him and he lit that fire and he went out and he accomplished a great work. But these walls came down at this time and remained down for a long time. Then Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, carried away captive to Babylon the remnant of the people who remained in the city and those who defected to him. The remnant of the people who remained in the city and those who defected to him. The word of Yehovah was in previous chapters that for those who defect over to Babylon, to Nebuchadnezzar, your life will be spared. And so it was. But notice how it says, the remnant of the people. The remnant. Because the vast, vast majority of them were slaughtered at this time. The vast majority. We're actually going to learn in chapter 52 the exact number of Jews that were taken captive into Babylon. And it's not very many. It's in the low thousands. And there were also some, as we're going to read, there were some of the poorest of the people who, generally speaking, generally speaking, are uh, humble, or at least more humble than others. Nebuzaradan and Nebuchadnezzar allowed them, some of them, to stay in Judah. Unfortunately, they end up rebelling and they go down to Egypt and they take and they take Jeremiah forcefully down to Egypt with them where Jeremiah in chapters 42 through 44 tells them you guys are going to die here in Egypt you're going to die you're going to be cursed and that's going to be the end of you but nevertheless Nebuzaradan does leave a small number of poor left in the land of Judah and virtually everybody else is killed everyone else the number of people that are killed is just far, far, far outweighs the number that survive, whether through being carried away captive into Babylon or being allowed to remain in Judah. Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, carried away captive to Babylon the remnant of the people who remained in the city and those who defected to him with the rest of the people who remained. But Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, left in the land of Judah the poor people who had nothing and gave them vineyards and fields at the same time. These are the poor people that eventually go down to Egypt. Now Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, gave charge concerning Jeremiah to Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, saying to him, Take him, take Jeremiah, and look after him, and do him no harm, but do to him just as he says to you. I find that very, very interesting, very powerful. 
here's crazy evil Nebuchadnezzar, even though he wasn't like crazy evil. I mean, technically those, uh, the wicked people in Jerusalem are far more evil than Nebuchadnezzar. In previous chapters of Jeremiah, Yehovah God refers to Nebuchadnezzar as his servant. As his servant, because he is actually going to carry out the will of Yehovah to, dis- to bring destruction on his wicked people. So, Nebuchadnezzar actually shows Jeremiah something that not even Jeremiah's own people showed him. Respect. <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar shows respect to Jeremiah. Very, very likely because he had heard of a good man, a prophet in the city of Jerusalem that tried to get the king and the princes and the nobles and the general populace to surrender the city. Jeremiah tried for years. He, Jeremiah was thrown in prison. He was thrown into a dungeon filled with mire and muck because he was trying to convince all the people to surrender to Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar most likely heard of this Jeremiah. And so when he's found in the house of Jonathan in the court of the prison, he says to Nebuchadnezzar, the captain of the guard, take him and look after him. And do him no harm, but do to him just as he says to you. I really don't think Jeremiah saw that one coming, actually. I don't think he saw that one coming. As we have been reading in previous chapters up until this point, you read Jeremiah's words and it really sounds like he believes he's going to die. I don't see any evidence to believe the contrary, that he didn't think he was going to die when the city was taken. He probably believed he was going to die. And yet, he's preserved. He's delivered. He doesn't, not only is he not killed, the king of Babylon tells his right-hand man, Nebuchadnezzar, that Jeremiah, take care of him, look after him. And do him no harm, but do him just as he says to you. Because of the inspiration of Yehovah, help and relief from pain, anguish, tragedy, tribulation, sorrow, relief can come in the most unexpected ways. I guarantee that Jeremiah didn't think that he would be relieved by Nebuchadnezzar. Again, I see no evidence in the word to even remotely indicate that he believed that. I see evidence that he believed he was going to die. But no, in the very moment that Jeremiah thinks he's going to die, the city has been breached. The Babylonian army is coming through the city, slaughtering the people. And Jeremiah is there in the court of the prison going, well, this is it. Okay, ready to go. And (laughs) Nebuchadnezzar himself tells his captain, take care of this man. Show this man respect. Pretty powerful. So Nebuchadnezzar, the captain of the guard, sent Nebuchadnezzar, there's that Nebu in there, one of the Babylonian god names, Rab Saris, Nurgul Sharezer, Rab Rabmag, and all the king and all the king of Babylon's chief officers. Then they sent someone to take Jeremiah from the court of the prison and committed him to Gedaliah the son of Ahikam, the son of Shephan, that he should take him home. Gedaliah is made governor of Judah by Nebuchadnezzar. The kings of Judah are done. The kings of Judah are done. Nebuchadnezzar has had it with Judah. He's had it with this kingdom. 
in the West that just keeps bothering me, keeps rebelling against me. I'm done with this kingdom. I'm going to make them a province in my empire. And so he appoints Gedaliah the governor. He had Jeremiah committed to Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, the son of Shepan, that he should take him home. Remember the last time Jeremiah tried to go home? He's heading out of the, the gate, the gate of Benjamin, on his way back to Anathoth, his home, three miles away in the land of Benjamin. And one of the Jews, the captain of their guards, uh, Erijah by name, captures him, takes him to the nobles in Jerusalem. They punch him, they hit him, and they throw him in prison. And then they throw him in a dungeon. And then when Jeremiah gets out of the dungeon and comes to Zedekiah, king of Judah, he pleads with Zedekiah to let him go. Just let me go home. And Zedekiah goes, no, throw you back in prison. This is how Jeremiah was treated by his own people. Hmm. I don't know about you, but the words of Yeshua are coming to my mind that a prophet... A true prophet of God, yeah, has no respect in his own country, has no honor in his own land among his own people. Yeah, isn't that the truth? Think about Yeshua himself. Yeshua, a Jew, is there in the land of Judah among his brothers and sisters, fellow Jews, and very few listen to him. Most hated him. Most hated him. And eventually killed him for his preaching. Whew! A prophet has no honor in his own country. But, but people from another country, that, like, you would never imagine this. People from another country show him honor and show him respect. Interesting. And, we ha and yes, we have to take it a step further and we apply it again to our Lord Yeshua. While it's true that all the, the true followers of Yeshua in the first century, or I mean, for the early part of the, um, the apostles teaching, going out teaching the truth, virtually all the followers of Yeshua were Jewish. That's how it started. But that's not where it grew. That's not where faith in Jesus exploded and just took off on this exponential level. That happened among the Gentiles. That happened among the spiritual Babylonians, the pagans, the heathens, where the Jews showed no honor to the prophet Yeshua. It was the spiritual Babylonians that did show him honor and did show him respect. We see the exact same thing happening here with Jeremiah. That they should have him taken home. <sighs> Nebuchadnezzar is the one that gets Jeremiah home. Amazing. So he, Jeremiah, dwelt among the people. Meanwhile, the word of Yehovah had come to Jeremiah while he was shut up in the court of the prison, saying, Go and speak to Ebed-Melech the Ethiopian. If you remember from last week, Ebed-Melech is the Ethiopian eunuch who begged King Zedekiah to bring Jeremiah up out of the dungeon, out of the mire. Ebed-Melech is the a servant of King Zedekiah that saved Jeremiah's life. So because this Ethiopian, there it is, again applied. He's an Ethiopian. He's not a Jew. A prophet truly has no honor among his own people in his own country. But among Babylonians and Ethiopians, they honor him. Because this Ethiopian showed honor and respect to Jeremiah. We're actually going to read 
what God promises this man. Go and speak to Ebed Melech the Ethiopian, saying, Thus says Yehovah of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will bring my words upon this city for adversity and not for good, and they shall be performed in that day before you. But I will deliver you in that day, says Yehovah, and you shall not be given into the hand of the men of whom you are afraid. For I will surely deliver you, and you shall not fall by the sword, but your life shall be as a prize to you. Why? Because you have put your trust in me, says Yehovah. Yes. Yes. Ebed Melech. He shows honor and respect to Jeremiah, a servant of Yehovah. And by showing honor to a servant of Yehovah, you show honor to Yehovah. I swear I've heard something like that before. Yeshua saying that those who honor the Son honor the Father. And the Son, Yeshua, is the holy servant of Yehovah. Yeshua is the prophet like Moses. And when you show honor and respect to Yeshua or to any true servant of Yehovah, you show honor and respect to Yehovah. You have put your trust in me, says Yehovah. I will deliver you in that day. A physical promise of physical delivery, deliverance, spirit of the word, because you trust in me, says Yehovah, in the day of judgment, in the day of affliction, in the day of tribulation, you put your trust in me, I will deliver you. Yes, that right there. This word. From the Father to Jeremiah, delivered to Ebed Melech the Ethiopian, Ebed Melech the Gentile, who honored and respected the servant of God. It's a word to each and every one of us that if we honor and respect the holy servant of God, if we honor and respect Yeshua, we are putting our trust in Yehovah God. And if you do that, then in this day of adversity, you will be delivered. Whew. That's a powerful word. That is a powerful word and a powerful promise. Take that one to heart. Take that one to the bank. <laughs> because you can. You can take you can take Yehovah at his word. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because he is always true to his word. Let's turn now to Jeremiah chapter 52, where we're going to read this uh, very quickly. We're going to get through 52 very quickly. It's a review of the fall of Jerusalem. There are a few additional details that we'll discuss, but for the most part, it's a review. This chapter is almost identical to the chapter in 2 Kings 25, chapter 25. If you read 2 Kings chapter 25 and you compare it to Jeremiah 52, it is almost identical. Almost identical. There is one major difference between the two chapters which we will discuss coming up. Turn with me, if you will, to Jeremiah 52. The fall of Jerusalem reviewed. Zedekiah was 21 years old when he became king, and he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Hamutal, the daughter of Jeremiah of Libna. So this would mean that Zedekiah's uh, 
mother, grandmother would be Hamutal. He had a great grandfather named Jeremiah. How about that? So his mother's name was Hamutal, the daughter of Jeremiah of Libna. Oh no. That's my bad. It would have been his grandfather. Whatever the relation. <laughs> Whatever the late relation may be. He, Zedekiah, also did evil in the sight of Yehovah, according to all that Jehoiakim had done. The previous king. Uh, technically, there was another king between the two of them, Jehoiachin, but he only reigned for three months and ten days. Jehoiakim also reigned for eleven years. So, just like Jehoiakim did evil in the sight of Yehovah, so did Zedekiah. For because of the anger of Yehovah, this happened in Jerusalem and Judah, till he finally cast them out from his presence. Then Zedekiah rebelled against the king of Babylon. He rebelled against the king of Babylon, and Nebuchadnezzar is like, I'm done, I'm done, I'm done. This nation of Judah is going down. Now it came to pass in the ninth year of Zedekiah's reign, in the tenth month, on the tenth day of the month, uh, this gives the actual day, uh, whereas chapter 39 does not give the day, that the siege began. It says that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and all his army came against Jerusalem and encamped against it. So the city was besieged until the eleventh year of King Zedekiah. And by the fourth month, on the ninth day of the month, the famine had become so severe in the city that there was no food for the people of the land. No food. Yeah, we talked about this last week. No food, but uh, gnawing on the bones of their own family members. <clears throat> but uh, I won't go into that because I covered that last week. Cannibalism going on right here at this time. The famine had become so severe in the city that there was no food for the people of the land. Then the city wall was broken through, and all the men of war fled and went out of the city at night by way of the gate between the two walls, which was by the king's garden, even though the Chaldeans were near the city all around. And they, this would be the, the men of war with King Zedekiah, Zedekiah's family, uh, children, and the nobles. And they went out by way of the plain, or by the Jordan Valley. But the army of the Chaldeans pursued the king, and they overtook Zedekiah in the plains of Jericho. All his army was scattered from him. So they took the king and brought him up to the king of Babylon at Riblah in the land of Hamath, and he pronounced judgment on him. Then the king of Babylon killed the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes, and he killed all the princes of Judah in Riblah. He also put out the eyes of Zedekiah. And the king of Babylon bound him in bronze fetters, took him to Babylon, here's an additional detail, and put him in prison till the day of his death. Thus is the fate of King Zedekiah. Yehovah God prophesied that this would happen to Ezekiel. In Ezekiel chapter 13, Yehovah says through Ezekiel that the king of Judah, one of these great princes of Judah, is going to be brought to Babylon where he'll die, but he won't see it. He won't see Babylon because his eyes are put out. Zedekiah who, it's this irony of ironies, you know, it's, uh, the name Zedekiah means Yehovah 
is righteous. Yehovah, our righteousness, is what Zedekiah means. And he's anything but righteous. Zedekiah chose darkness rather than light. And because he chose darkness, Yehovah God, one of his judgments against this man is that you're going to spend the rest of your life in the darkness you've chosen and you're going to go to prison in Babylon and you're going to be bound until the day you die. Put him in prison until the day of his death. Now, in the fifth month, on the tenth day of the month, which was the nineteenth year of King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, now this is interesting, the city was besieged, no, excuse me, it was uh, entered, the, the wall was penetrated in the fourth month on the ninth day of the month, but the city and temple are plundered and burned a month later. So the city is penetrated. There's this great slaughter of the people so that only there's this remnant left that's taken into Babylon. Zedekiah, he has his eyes put it out. He's taken into Babylon. But it's in the fifth month, on the tenth day of the month, almost exactly one month later, that Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, who served the king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem, or he returned to Jerusalem. And he burned the house of Yehovah and the king's house, all the houses of Jerusalem, that is. All the houses of Jerusalem, that is, all the houses of the great he burned with fire. So it's not the entire city was burned, but primarily the houses of the nobles, the great ones. The high and mighty ones, yeah, burned all them with fire. And all the army of the Chaldeans who were with the captain of the guard broke down all the walls of Jerusalem all around. So it is at this time that all the walls of Jerusalem are brought down and destroyed. Then Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, carried away captive some of the poor people, the rest of the people who remained in the city, the rest of the people, the remnant of the people who remained in the city, the defectors who had deserted to the king of Babylon, and the rest of the craftsmen. But Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, left some of the poor of the land as vine dressers and farmers. Again, the same people that flee to Egypt. The bronze pillars. Oh, now this is interesting. Here's where we're going to be making a comparison between Jeremiah 52 and 2 Kings 25. Talking about the bronze pillars that were in the house of Yehovah. These would be the two pillars that are in the front of the house of Yehovah. Bronze pillars that were in the house of Yehovah and the carts and the bronze sea that were in the house of Yehovah. The bronze sea was the large basin that was atop the bronze oxen. The bronze sea that were in the house of Yehovah, the Chaldeans broke in pieces and carried all their bronze to Babylon. They also took away the pots, the shovels, the trimmers, the bowls, the spoons, and all the bronze utensils with which the priests ministered. The basins, the firepans, the bowls, the pots, the lampstands, the spoons, and the cups, whatever was solid gold and whatever was solid silver, the captain of the guard took away. It's interesting that those are the three things three metals that are at the temple. Gold, silver, and bronze. Highest value, medium value, lowest value. Inside the temple to even into the Holy of Holies, the holiest place in the temple, the holy place, and the courtyard. 
gold, silver, bronze, celestial, terrestrial, telestial. Mm -hmm. That's how it works. That's how it works. Gold, silver, and bronze. The two pillars, the one C, the 12 bronze bowls, which were under it, and the carts, which King Solomon had made for the house of Yehovah, the bronze of all these articles was beyond measure. Just an immense amount of material, immense amount of bronze. Which also is interesting. If the bronze is a symbol of, and it's in the outer courtyard of the temple, the largest area of the temple where the majority of the people are, that's the image, the majority of the people, yeah, they end up in that lowest kingdom. They end up in that telestial kingdom. It says that the bronze of all these articles was beyond measure, or almost beyond number. It's the only thing that's given, that gives a, a number to it. Hmm. Yep. The majority of the people end up in the courtyard. But I don't want to be in the courtyard. And I know you don't want to be in the courtyard. And I don't even want to be in the holy place. I mean, I'm sure the holy place is, is great. But that's not where I want to be. I want to be in the holy of holies. I want to be in the holy city, the new Jerusalem. I want to be at the very throne of Almighty God, the Ark of the Covenant, kept in the holy of holies, which we're going to briefly talk about coming up. The bronze of all these articles was beyond measure. Now, concerning the pillars, these two massive pillars. The height of one pillar was 18 cubits. Now, it depends on what type of cubit you're using for your measurement. Um, the Egyptian cubit, for instance, is 21 inches. It's the length from the tip of your middle finger to your elbow. Now, I do not have an Egyptian cubit. I honestly don't even know what my cubit is, but the average cubit that was used at this time uh, was 18 inches. So you're looking at 18 inches to 21 inches for their cubit. And each one of these two pillars was 18 cubits. So we work that out. 18 times, we'll go at that lowest number, each cubit is 18 inches, so 18 times 18 comes to 324 inches. We divide that by 12 to get our feet. That means that each one of these pillars is 27 feet tall. Concerning the pillars, the height of one pillar was 18 cubits. A measuring line of 12 cubits could measure its circumference. So... Uh, all around the circumference is 12 cubits. Big, big, wide pillar. And its thickness was four fingers. Four fingers. Could be three some odd inches thick. It was hollow. <laughs> okay. Read this again. Now concerning the pillars, the height of a pillar was 18 cubits. A measuring line of 12 cubits could measure its circumference, and its thickness was four fingers. It was hollow. It's not solid bronze. The capital of bronze was on it, a capital of bronze, which is solid bronze, something that's set on top of the pillar. A capital of bronze was on it, and the height of one capital was five cubits, with a network and pomegranates all around the capital, all of bronze. So etched in, it's like a network, almost like vines, if you will, you know, carved into the bronze, and pomegranates carved into the, the capital on top of the pillar. The second pillar with pomegranates was the same. 
there were 96 pomegranates on all the sides. All the pomegranates all around on the network were 100. So 96 on the sides, and then it seems like there would have been maybe four additional on the very top, maybe on each of the four sides, totaling 100 of these carved pomegranates in each one of these capitals. Capitals of pure bronze, five cubits in height, set atop these 18 cubit high hollow bronze pillars. Hmm. Let's quickly go to 2 Kings 25 where we're going to read right here verse 17. Verse 17, 2 Kings 25. The height of one pillar was 18 cubits, and the capital on it was of bronze. The height of the capital was three cubits. Hmm. Jeremiah 52. The capital was five cubits in height. 2 Kings 25. The capital was three cubits. So what is it? Are the capitals of bronze set atop these two massive pillars just outside the, the temple, right there in the courtyard of the temple? Are they five cubits in height or are they three cubits in height? This is where I am going to defer you to a teaching series by Michael Rood of A Rood Awakening International Ministries. A teaching series which you really do owe it to yourself. If you haven't already watched it, you really owe it uh, not, to, not to just to yourself. You owe, you owe it to Almighty God to watch this teaching series. It is called The Great Secret of Solomon's Temple. The Great Secret of Solomon's Temple. And I'm going to include a link to the playlist in the video description below. The Great Secret of Solomon's Temple. It's a total of 11 videos. Each video is about 14, 15 minutes long. So the total length of the teaching is about two and a half, maybe just under three hours long. But you really need to check out this teaching. The Great Secret of Solomon's Temple will answer this question about the bronze capitals atop those two massive pillars of bronze, hollow pillars of bronze. Jeremiah 52 says that the capitals were five cubits in height. 2 Kings 25 verse 17 says they were three cubits in height. What is it? Is it a scribe translational error? Or is it something else? <laughs> I'm going to... Uh, I'm going to suggest very, very, very strongly that it's something else. Now, I'm not going to spoil it for those of you who have not yet seen this teaching, The Great Secret of Solomon's Temple. Uh, but I will tell you it's incredible. It's incredible teaching, incredible uh, information. And it does answer the question as to where the Ark of the Covenant ended up. Where did the Ark of the Covenant go? I mean, the Ark of the Covenant is the number one article. I mean, it's the number one item to get out of the temple. If there's anything that you need to get out of the temple, I mean, you can just picture Nebuchadnezzar talking to Nebuchadnezzar saying, like, you need to make sure that you get the Ark of the Covenant. That thing is the throne of their God. It is the greatest thing there is. We need to get that Ark of the Covenant. And yet, in all of the writings of all of the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple, King Solomon's temple, the first temple, 
there's not a single mention of the Ark of the Covenant being taken because it wasn't. <laughs> it was hidden away in Jerusalem, or I should say under Jerusalem, and I believe that there's some pretty, pretty good evidence to say that it was hidden under Jerusalem through the temple. I'm just going to say that, no more, but uh, you can learn all about that by watching The Great Secret of Solomon's Temple, and once again, link to the playlist in the video description below. Moving on. The captain of the guard took Seriah, the chief priest, Zephaniah, the second priest, and the three doorkeepers. He also took out of the city an officer who had charge of the men of war, seven men of the king's close associates who were found in the city, the principal scribe of the army who mustered the people of the land, and sixty men of the people of the land who were found in the midst of the city. And Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, took these and brought them to the king of Babylon at Riblah. Then the king of Babylon struck them and put them to death at Riblah in the land of Hamath. Thus Judah was carried away captive from its own land. These are the people whom Nebuchadnezzar carried away captive. Okay? Three captivities a total of this many people taken into taken from Judah into Babylon in the 7th year 3023 Jews in the 18th year of Nebuchadnezzar he carried away captive from Jerusalem 832 persons in the 23rd year of Nebuchadnezzar Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, carried away captive of the Jews, 745 persons. All the persons were 4,600. Not a very massive amount. 4,600 were carried away captive from Judah into Babylon. Some of the poor of the land were left as vine dressers and farmers, they go down to Egypt where they die in Egypt, and everyone else is killed. Everyone else either died from disease or the famine, or they died of hunger or thirst, or they were killed at the time the city was taken. All the persons that were actually taken to Babylon totaled 4,600. And they were there in Babylon minimum 70 years. It was 70 years before any of them could return to Judah, the descendants return. There were a lot of Jews that did stay in Babylon. But from 4,600 people, God rose up a nation there in a Gentile location, which, by the way, we can also look at from the spirit of the word, that no matter where you may be, no matter what nation, Gentile nation, you might currently be, Yehovah God is doing the exact same thing, and he has been doing the same thing for a long time. He's been working throughout all nations of the world to bring out, to raise up a remnant of his people, to raise up a spiritual nation, a spiritual house of Israel from every nation of the earth through all of these Gentile nations. Very small number begins, but after 70 years, that number had grown to hundreds of thousands. Or the total number after, you know, so many years was just tens of thousands and yes, hundreds of thousands. But it began with 
only 4,600. And then we come to the final verses in the book of Jeremiah. Here it is. I mean, we're not done, done with the book of Jeremiah because there's still additional chapters we need to read. But as far as what concludes the book of Jeremiah, here it is. This is the end. Jehoiachin is released from prison. Now it came to pass in the 37th year of the captivity of Jehoiachin, who's also known as uh, Jeconiah or Konia, same guy, Jehoiachin, king of Judah, he had only reigned as king for three months and ten days. In the tenth month, on the twenty-fifth day of the month, that evil Marodach, or Marduk is another way of translation, evil Marduk, a future king of Babylon, was named or given the title of one of the Babylonian gods, Marduk. That evil Marodach, or evil Marduk, king of Babylon, in the first year of his reign, lifted up the head of Jehoiachin, king of Judah. Another way it can be translated is, showed favor to Jehoiachin, king of Judah, and brought him out of prison. After 37 years. And he spoke kindly to him and gave him a more prominent seat than those of the kings who were with him in Babylon. So Jehoiachin changed from his prison garments, and he ate bread regularly before the king all the days of his life. And as for his provisions, there was a regular ration given him by the king of Babylon, a portion for each day until the day of his death, all the days of his life. And that concludes the book of Jeremiah. Whew. Wow. Incredible. Absolutely amazing. Again, we're not finished. We're not finished with Jeremiah. No, not yet. We still need to read 40 and 41. Technically, I already have covered 42, 43, and 44 a long, long time ago. That was part three of my Ishtar special that I did a year and a half ago, <laughs> a long time ago. But uh, I did already cover 42, 43, and 44. I haven't decided if I'll just do a quick rereading of them, but... Uh, uh, certainly, you can go back and you can rewatch that teaching if you so desire. We already have read 45. We're basically looking at 40, 41, and then we come to the prophetic chapters about the judgments of God on the Gentile nations of the earth, which comprises chapters 46 to 51. It talks about the judgment on Egypt, uh, judgment on Philistia, judgment on Moab, judgment on Ammon, judgment on Edom, judgment on Damascus, judgment on Kedar and Hazar, judgment on Elam, and judgment on Babylon. And then Chapter 51, Prophecy of the Utter Destruction of Babylon. And that will be it. We will have completed the whole book of Jeremiah. Whew. End is in sight. <laughs> the end is in sight. But I got to tell you, chapters 46 through 51 are a lot of these crammed, packed chapters. So it's, uh, it'll still take us a little bit to get through them, but nevertheless, we're coming to the end of the book of Jeremiah. Easily, easily one of my personal favorite books because it is so prophetic and so pertinent, so relevant to us in our day.
I mean, you read Jeremiah and it's just, it just drips with truth and parallelisms to us in our day, in our time. It is the reason why when I began this ministry just over two years ago, that God told me, told me right from the beginning, you need to cover Jeremiah. You have to cover Jeremiah. So, it is my sincerest hope that this book has thus far been an incredible blessing in your life, that you have learned just, just you've received treasure troves of knowledge and light and understanding and wisdom from this wonderful, great man of God. You've come to know him and understand him and empathize with him, sympathize with him, to love him. As I love him, I love Jeremiah, and I hope you do too. I really hope you do. I thank you, my friends, my brothers and sisters, for joining me for this week's Sabbath teaching. I do hope it was a blessing to you, and I would like to close this teaching with the priestly blessing from Numbers chapter 6. Yehovah bless you and keep you. Yehovah, make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Yehovah, lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the high priest of the King of Righteousness, our Lord Yeshua. Amen. Thank you again for joining me, my dear friends. Thank you, thank you. And like to conclude, as I always do, huge, huge thank you to all of the supporters of this work, the supporters and patrons of this ministry at patreon.com slash YHVH. Thank you, my dear friends. I say it every week, but it needs to be said every week because my heart just overflows with gratitude for each and every one of you. This ministry never could have happened, never would have happened without your support. So I thank each and every one of you. And as I always do, I still, I put it out there. There's the invitation to those who have not yet supported the work of this ministry. If this ministry has blessed your life, Please, con please consider, just consider going to patreon.com slash YHVH and offering your support. It's really not difficult to do. Just make the decision. Make the decision to support a work that is certainly striving, striving with, with all my heart and soul to do the will of God and teach and preach the truth of his word. So please consider going to patreon.com slash YHVH and becoming one of our monthly patrons today. And you can do so, as always, by clicking on this button right here. It'll take you to our main page where you can sign up to become a patron. Thank you again, my friends, for joining me. And may Yehovah's love and shalom be with you all. Bye-bye.